Okay. So hi, everyone. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. My name is Sammy Godlov. I'm the Central Oregon Field Associate for Oregon Wild, uh, again, based out of the Bend, Oregon office with the Deschutes River uh, right next to me. And for those who aren't familiar with Oregon Wild, um, it did seem like we have quite a few new people, so welcome. But anyways, if you aren't familiar with us or you're new to us, we work to protect and restore Oregon's uh, wildlife, wildlands, and waters as an enduring legacy for future generations. And this year is our 50th anniversary, uh, which is a really exciting time um, for us, the organization, um, all of our supporters. And if you are an Oregon Wild member, you know whether you've been around for 30 years or a few weeks, uh, you really are the reason that Oregon Wild has stuck around all these years for five decades. Um, and also the reason that, you know, we'll, we'll keep going and we'll keep fighting to protect all of these wild places that we love so much. Uh, so thank you so much for your continued support um, over the years. It means a lot to all of us at Oregon Wild. And if you have been with us for a while, uh, you might notice something different on the slide that I have up. And that's that we have a new logo um, as of yesterday. Uh, so if you look down in the lower left-hand corner, that is our new logo. Um, so yeah, we got a new logo for our 50th anniversary. There'll be lots of other fun events. Um, it's a lot of fun things happening for this special 50th anniversary year for Oregon Wild. Um, okay, so I just have a few housekeeping items I want to go over, and then I will hand it off to our presenter for tonight. So first... Thank you to all who purchased a raffle ticket this evening. We will be raffling off a copy of our Oregon Ancient Forest Hiking Guide, which was written by our staff member, uh, Chandra Ligui, as well as an Oregon Wild Way t-shirt. Uh, these raffle ticket purchases not only help us continue these Wild Wednesday presentations, but also help make all the work that we do at Oregon Wild possible. Uh, so thank you so much to everyone who bought one of those. And then the winners will be notified via email uh, within the next couple of days. So be on the lookout for that. And then a recording of this webcast will be sent out to everyone who registered and will also be available on our website, OregonWild.org, um, under the Wild blog section. And then lastly, we will have a few minutes for Q&A at the end. Uh, but please feel free to submit your questions throughout the presentation as they come up. We typically receive a rush of submissions close to the end, so getting them in early will really help me organize them um, so we can make sure that we get to as many of them as possible. And you can submit your questions by using the Q&A function at the top of the screen. Um, so you'll see it says Q&A. Um, oh, actually, one last thing. Uh, so our next webcast is on Wednesday, April 17th with Marette Pajuti, who is a retired U.S. Forest Service ecologist. Um, who will be talking about the Glaze Meadow Project near Sisters, Oregon, in Central Oregon, which is a uh, dry forest restoration project that Oregon Wild helped design with the Confederated Tribes of the Warm Springs and the Forest Service several years ago uh, to restore a previously heavily logged forest to one that now provides important fish and, wild fish and wildlife habitat, uh, stores a vast amount of carbon in mature and old growth trees, uh, and is fire adapted. Um, so make sure to join us for that webcast to learn more. Um, if you're signed up for our email list and newsletters, you'll be notified once that is available. Um, and that's all I have for you. So I am very excited to introduce you to our presenter tonight. Uh, Dr. Nicholas Famoso is the paleontology program manager and museum curator at the John Day Fossil Beds National Monument. He is a vertebrate paleontologist with a master's in geological sciences and a PhD in earth sciences from the University of Oregon. And today he will be talking all about uh, the geology, paleontology, and natural history of the John Day River Basin, which is definitely one of my favorite places in Oregon. Um, so I will stop sharing my screen and then Nick, you can share your screen and take all it right. away. Thank you so much right. for joining us. Yeah, no problem. Let me um, play a little dance here, making sure I'm getting the right screen. Um, okay, so that should be the right screen. And then I just need to start this. Okay, is that all looking good to everybody? Good to go? Okay. 
All right. Um, so yes, hi uh, again. Thank you for um, inviting me on, uh, Dr. Nick Famoso. I've been at John Day Fossil Beds for about seven years or so, um, a little longer than that. Uh, so I've been on the uh, been working in the John Day area for a lot longer than that. Uh, so a lot of time on the John Day River. I grew up down in Southern Oregon, spent a lot of time on the Rogue River. Uh, so that's another river that's particularly close to my heart. And then, of course, being in <laughs> University of Oregon, I was right next to the Willamette. So three very important rivers in, in Oregon, uh, all a big part of my life. Um, but anyway, yeah, so we're not here to talk so much about the living things. We're here to talk about the not so <laughs> recently living things um, and the rocks and things like that. So I'm excited to talk to you a bit about the geology and paleontology and a few other things of what we have um, out in the John Day area. So the first thing that I'm going to want to talk with you guys a little bit about is kind of definitions, right? So there's a John Day fossil beds lowercase on the fossil beds, and that's if you look at the image on the right, um, or sorry, on your left, that is going to be what, what I'm calling the fossil beds lowercase. Uh, these are the different, the primary um, formations that we have in the National Monument, but this is generally like when we're talking about the John Day fossil beds broader sense, this is what I'm talking about. So it's really most of the state of Oregon. It goes far beyond the John Day River Basin. You got the Deschutes, um, several others that are mixed in there as well. Um, so that's an important thing. And when I talk about the monument, I'm talking about those three black dots that are in there. So John Day Fossil Beds National Monument is just a tiny little fraction. And we are about 14,000 acres, but it's a tiniest bit of the overall fossil beds, which is pretty cool. Uh, think about that we have some important sites, but there's so much more that we could be working with, and we do. Um, and then the image on the right uh, from the from the DEQ is the definition of what the John Day River Basin actually is, right? So that includes the Middle Fork the and the North Fork and the main stem of the river, um, starting off, you know, in the areas that it starts off in the in the Blue Mountains and then drains out into the Columbia. Um, and there's a lot of very interesting geologic history that is preserved in that little, I guess not that little, but in that green, green blob over there, there's quite a lot of interesting history that we see um, in the fossil record and the rock record. Um, and before I get too far, I just want to, you know, make sure that I talk about those partners that we work with, right? So I'm Park Service, right? So I, um, I work for the National Park Service, the National Monument, both Painted Hill, or all three of our units, Painted Hills, Clarno, and Sheep Rock are all run by the Park Service for one park together. Um, and you can kind of see in here, uh, it's maybe it's not as clear, um, but there's the John Day River, if you can see my cursor there, um, the John Day River, and then it hits these blobs of yellow following the river, and that's all BLM land, some of that's wild and scenic. Um, <clears throat> and it kind of follows down through here, cuts, uh, cuts over somewhere over here. I can't remember exactly where, but the Clarno unit is right here. Um, and the river goes right by that unit and then cuts over, um, I believe over in this direction and then cuts down here. Um, and the headwaters of the river are over here. Uh, but what you're seeing is these uh, purple parts, which are the um, Park Service, the yellow, which is the BLM, Bureau of Land Management, and these big bits of green are forest service, right? So it's, you know, there's a lot of public lands out here. And this is the tribe. This is the um, uh, Warm Springs over here and the Umatilla up here at the top. Um, but it's a lot of private land and a lot of public land in this area. Um, and so this is why, like, it is so important for us to be collaborating with the work that I do as a paleontologist and a geologist because uh, we can't simply can't do the work without working with all of our partners, right? And that includes some of the agencies I've already mentioned. We've also got some Fish and Wildlife Service land that we work with. There's a little bit of BOR um, in some extra areas that we have. The state of Oregon has some land that we work with. And then we work collaboratively with our tribes as well, the Burns Paiute, the um, Umatilla, and the Warm Springs. And some of our private partners that we worked with in the past include, this is not an exhaustive list, uh, but the Nature Conservancy, many, many private landowners. And we've worked with several land trusts and watersheds for restoration projects and other sorts of things, right? We, you know, not so much geology and paleontology, but um, yeah, so it's a lot of partnerships that we have had to build over the years in order to 
do our mission, which is to tell the story of the geology and paleontology of Eastern Oregon and Central Oregon, essentially. So now that we've kind of got that out of the way, uh, I know we've got a general audience, so I do want, I want to do some basic geology 101 here. Um, if you don't remember the three basic types of rocks, I'm just going to, because I'm going to be talking about these, I want to make sure I get this out for everybody. So just as a reminder, the three types of rocks are igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic. Um, igneous rocks are the ones basically that come out of a volcano. So you've got, you know, intrusive rocks, which are from directly from magma, and then you've got extrusive rocks that are from lavas. Um, so like a really great example of an extrusive would be like obsidian, right? So lava comes out and then <laughs> cools into glass. That's your igneous rocks. Sedimentary rocks can be formed a few different ways, but most of the way that we're looking at it is erosion uh, that breaks down other types of rocks and deposits that out. So anytime I'm talking about sedimentary rocks, I'm talking about things like sandstones, mudstones, limestones. Um, limestones are from chemical dissolution, so you get like little micro bodies of different types of small organisms, and those dissolve into limestone. Um, and we do actually have some coal in the Painted Hills unit. It's very low grade, uh, but that's all from organic matter that's been compressed and turned into sedimentary rock. Um, and then the other bit that we have a bit, especially in our older rocks that we'll hit first, is metamorphic rocks, our metamorphic rocks. Um, and that's essentially taking all types of rocks and applying more heat and pressure to them and squishing them around. And then you get, you know, things like slate and marble. Uh, so those are the, the main types of rocks that we're going to talk about. Now, there's another thing I've got in there, too, that's ash that comes out of a volcano. It's important for telling how old fossils are. Um, but, you know, you can have a pretty good philosophical debate about whether or not it's an igneous rock or a sedimentary rock. Most of the time I fall on the side of it's sedimentary, but um, it's a it's another thing that we have a lot of. <sighs> One final thing before we really start driving more into the John Day Basin itself is geologic time, right? So Oregon has a fair bit of geologic time that mostly goes back into this uh, green column over here called the Paleozoic. This is where it starts. Um, so we're talking anywhere between like 500 and 220 million years ago um, is where a lot of our like basement rock comes from. So I've got some pretty old stuff and mostly this is seashore beds or not seashore, seashore and seabeds um, that get pushed up onto the land. Um, and then we move into the Mesozoic, which is the age of dinosaurs. Um, and we do have a few chunks of rock in there that are from the age of dinosaurs. And that ranges from about 250 to uh, 60 million years ago, roughly, is the is the age of dinosaurs there. Um, and then most of the fossils that we have, and probably what I'll spend most of my time talking about, because this is what I study, is the Cenozoic, uh, which is roughly seven or 60 million years ago up to today, right? And this is what's called the age of mammals and flowering plants. Uh, so this is where most of Oregon's fossil record is from. Uh, that we know very well, but there are some very key things throughout all of Oregon's history that do that that do come from the Mesozoic, specifically, and a little bit from the Paleozoic, as far as fossils are concerned. Um, so this is uh, kind of the time frame that we're working in, and these colors will come up again. You'll see colors that match uh, the colors that you see with some of those, particularly with the Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous, and uh, those Cenozoic rocks that we have there. Okay, so now here is a geologic map of the John Day Basin. Again, if you can see my uh, cursor, I'll follow the river here, right? So Columbia is up here. This is the John Day right through here. Uh, it's much easier to see on this map than the other one, and it comes back down here. The main stem goes out this way to where these red rocks are over here, red colored uh, chunks. And then the South Fork cuts off somewhere down here, goes a little bit further. I didn't capture all of it. Um, and then the, uh, the North Fork goes off into this part of the Blue Mountains a bit. Um, but so this is kind of what we're looking at. And it did, did kind of make this presentation a little bit easier that there's big chunks of the same kind of rock all over the place, like what we see up here, uh, closer to the Columbia. Um, so this is where we're kind of gonna, you know, we're gonna look at all these different types of rocks. We're not necessarily gonna go like down uh, upstream and follow the different rocks as you're going along that way. But what we will be doing is going back in time 
and moving forward to give you a sense of what the geology of this particular part of Oregon looked like and what the environments were like leading to what we see. Um, and I'm going to start each section with a little map that's going to show what the world looked like at the time and where we have known fossil localities from all over the world. So that's how we're going to start for each section. Uh, so the first one here is that Paleozoic. Um, I just kind of pulled a random one because knowing exactly where these rocks come from is a little hard. Um, <clears throat> but you can kind of see Oregon is in this weird jumbly mess over here. It's because Oregon wasn't really on land at the time. It was underwater uh, for all of this time. And what we see during this time are things like this, the Baker terrain, right, which are all metamorphic rocks. So uh, and these type of metamorphic rocks are all deep ocean seashore that's been slammed up onto the continent. So that's a big thing happening at this time is these big rotations of what are called accreted terrains. So big chunks of ground, you know, from not really ground, but the sea seabed gets shoved up onto the continent. Um, and that force of tectonic shifting and pressure um, kind of adds heat to it as well, and that heat and pressure is taking those deep ocean seabeds and converting them into these metamorphic rocks. It's a very beautiful green. Um, and uh, I mean, especially if you go down the South Fork, you'll see a lot of this stuff. It's really pretty. Um, and I don't see, a, I mean, I'm used to green rocks in the, in, <laughs> in the sheep rock unit, but this is a very different kind of green that I find very pretty. But if you go into some of the other rocks in the basin, you also see things like the Canyon Mountain Complex, which are these like red and white uh, metamorphic rocks, right? And so you do see things like this, especially down the South Fork. Um, and so it continues to tell the story of deep ocean sea, deep ocean sea floor as getting shoved up onto the continent and getting uh, exposed to heat and pressure. So then we zoom all the way up to the Triassic. So now we're about 220 million years ago and the world looks very different than it did before. Um, Pangaea was before this. So if you've ever heard of that, the one continent thing. Um, and during the Triassic, you start to see the splitting off of that land um, into these separate islands and things. And again, Oregon is still underwater at this time. Um, and you're starting to see a bit of other things start to uh, get deposited into these little basins around what will become eventually Oregon that uh, we know today. Um, and specifically, what we have are, is the Fields Creek Formation, Field Creek Formation. There's a couple of other formations that are kind of in the area, but this is like the biggest one. Um, and this is an unstable, steep margin, right? So basically, imagine an underwater marine basin, right? A big dip, a big bowl between some other areas where these terrains have been shoved up around it. And then those terrains are getting eroded and those big chunks are getting deposited into these basins. And that's what all these big chunky rocks are in here. Those are basically bits of the Baker terrain that have just fallen into this environment, right? So it's still marine, it's still underwater, but it's very chaotic and a lot of energy at this time. And, you know, we don't have, really have any fossils in this either because of how much energy is around in order to, you know, preserve this. So it's very, uh, there's a lot of motion and motion is really bad for preserving life um, as fossils. And so that's part of the reason why we don't really see a whole lot of anything that tells us about what the life was like during this time in these formations. Um, so then that's pretty much what we've got there for the Triassic. And then we move on into the Jurassic. Um, and the Triassic has some dinosaurs, but the Jurassic uh, worldwide, the Jurassic is really starting to get where you see like a lot of the dinosaurs that we're more used to seeing around the world. Still nothing in our fossil record about that, because if you can kind of notice on the map there, we're still pretty much underwater. And dinosaurs um, are only on land. There are marine reptiles and there are flying reptiles, right? But what, um, and we do see some of those later on, uh, but during the Jurassic here in Oregon, mostly what we see, like in this case, the Robertson Formation, you'll see these marine limestones and conglomerates, and marine limestones are a little bit further out, further away to get that dissolution of all those microorganisms. So this is like off the edge of the shelf a bit, uh, but what you do see in this are fossil clams, 
particularly oysters. And this is an example. The photo I have up there is an example of one of the oysters. Uh, this is a fossil from the University of Oregon collections. Um, and it's a type specimen. So it was the one uh, used to describe a whole species there. Um, and then there's also snails and brachiopods. And if you don't know what a brachiopod is, they are still around today. Uh, but they look a lot like clams. But instead of having two valves that are the same size and shape, uh, one valve is bigger and one valve is smaller. Um, so it's kind of just this looks a little bit different. It's very clam like, but it's not a clam. Um, so those are some of the organisms that we see in the Robertson formation. Um, then we move a little bit further in, inland from these uh, limestones to get to the Nicely formation. And this is one that is a, it's a marine shale. And you see a lot of ammonites, clams, and ichthyosaurs. And we all kind of know what clams are, so I didn't want to throw up a photo of a clam. But um, this picture I really like because it shows ichthyosaurs, which are swimming reptiles that look a lot like dolphins. Uh, or should I say dolphins look a lot like ichthyosaurs because they did this way before mammals even were a, a glint in anything's eyes. right? So this is a group of reptiles that um, basically serve that same kind of role in the niche. Um, that dolphins kind of do today. Um, and if you look very closely around this one, there are these little like nautilus looking things, the spiral shells with little squid heads sticking out. Those are the ammonites. Um, and ammonites are really important animals uh, for helping us figure out how old things are when we don't have um, ashes to tell us how old something is. Um, because they are very ubiquitous, they're very widespread, uh, so it's really easy to get ages on them because they're pretty globally spread. Um, so that's that's what we see in the Nicely Formation. And then we move up into the Snowshoe Formation, and this is a really cool one because up this is exposed up around the, uh, the South Fork and closer to the IZ area in Grant County. And it's a shallow marine sand and silt, and there's a photograph of it in the lower left-hand corner and kind of get a sense of like what that rock looks like. And you see a lot of fish, and you see some more ammonites, and you get some more oysters. But a really cool thing that came out of there is this crocodilomorph, um, which is a croc crocodile-shaped thing. Um, and I'm not going to try and pronounce that one, but the what's cool about this one is that the species was named after the North America Research Group, or NARG, which is based out of Portland, and they do a lot of advocational work um, with local community members from around, mostly from the Willamette Valley, but from a lot of other places too, and they'll come out and, um, you know, they know all the rules about collecting fossils, and they found this particular fossil, got it to a researcher, got it to a repository, and ended up being a whole new species, and this one was published in 2015. Um, it's not the first time that uh, NARG has been involved with helping the scientific community find new things. So this is a, a really cool, uh, just one of the many examples. Um, and we didn't even know about this thing right at all. We don't have very many vertebrate fossils that aren't fish from this period of time. Uh, but this was one that was found. And, you know, luckily we had those partnerships in order to make sure that this, that this thing was found and put in a proper repository to make sure that it was researched um, and published on. So, but again, still marine, shallow marine, so we're much closer to the shore than we were in the other two formations. Um, but, you know, this is just a pretty cool area that we that we see too. Um, and it's a really important part of the marine ecosystem. So then we move on into the Cretaceous, um, and we're still, you can almost kind of see Oregon starting to form there, but we're still very much in the water at that point. Um, but we're still sort of near shore pretty much the whole time in all the formations that we see in the John Day Basin that talk about this. So the first one I'll bring up here is the Bernard Formation, which is a near shore marine environment with mudstone shales and sandstones. Um, and these are all examples of snails and clams that have been described from that formation. Uh, I just pulled this straight out of the paper. This was published in 2002. Um, but a lot of very beautiful fossils that have come out of there. Um, some of these, like if you didn't know it was a fossil, you might not even think that it was a fossil. Um, but uh, yeah, so, you know, lots of near shore environments there being represented by those animals. Now, if you've ever been to the Sheep Rock unit of John Day fossil beds, you may have seen Goose Rock. Um, and Goose Rock is actually from the Cretaceous. It's the it's a little part of the park that we don't really tell people that we have from the age of dinosaurs, but we do have this part and it's made up of the Gable Creek Formation. And the Gable Creek Formation um, is very close to shore. 
Um, it's sandy marine deposits with a lot of fans, uh, fans and turbidites. And what that means is basically where a river enters the ocean, it dumps a lot of stuff into, into a fan. You see the same thing with lakes too sometimes. Um, and a turbidite is just a deposit um, that's from like a landslide that's coming into that area. So very high energy, a lot of uh, motion in this area right up on the seashore. And this is a place where we find not necessarily in Goose Rock, but other exposures, because this is also um, really well exposed over by Gable Creek near um, the Painted Hills unit, which is why it's called the Gable Creek Formation. But you see snails, clams, and tusk shells. Tusk shells are a type of mollusk also, if you, you know, see them out on the coast sometimes too. Um, and you also see a lot of wood and a lot of pollen that comes out of this particular area too. Um, and that's pretty much the only fossil that we have from this part. Um, now the Gable Creek Formation is the nearest shore part of uh, kind of a series or a facies um, that ends with our next formation, which is the Hudspeth Formation. And I kind of saved this one for now because it's the more exciting of the Cretaceous ones that we have, uh, because not only uh, do we see a lot of the invertebrates that we normally see, like ammonites and clams, but we also see sharks. Um, and these are exposures near the town of Mitchell. Um, and there has been a flying reptile. So there's like a pterodactyl-like thing, a uh, finger of one of them that was discovered near the town of Mitchell. We also see swimming reptiles, like the, uh, the animal that's depicted in that uh, lower right-hand image there. That is um, a pliosaur or a plesiosaur. Uh, it's a pliosaur is a type of plesiosaur, um, but it's a big marine reptile uh, that would have been out crunching on whatever it wanted to at the time. It was a fairly dominant taxon in the area, uh, species in the area. And this was another specimen that was originally discovered by the North America Research Group. So they found this in 2005, they found this skull and they worked with researchers to get it into a museum. It hasn't been published yet, um, but it is a really cool specimen and the only one that's ever been discovered in the state of Oregon. So that's really cool. Um, and I've got the little exclamation points there because we did actually get one dinosaur uh, fairly recently, um, scientifically speaking in 2018, we published not me personally, but the scientific community published um, a fossil of a dinosaur, of a hadrosaur, a duck-billed dinosaur that was discovered near the town of Mitchell. And um, it was literally just a single toe bone. That's all it was, was one little bone that's probably about an inch and a half by an inch in, in, um, in shape, right, in size. And that was enough to tell us that it was some sort of ornithopod, which is a type of duck-billed dinosaur. Um, so that's really cool that we have that here. It was, we think it was a bloat and float. So the animal died, floated out, and then animals were picking at the carcass and this toe bone just happened to float down to the bottom and get fossilized with all these other things. There's a few other um, things that come from this. And you, and you can see in the upper right-hand photo there, it's a, it's a kind of a tannish, um, low-lying formation. Um, but man, does it have a lot of fossils in it. Um, and this one is... Um, in a, in a particularly interesting area. It's very close to the Sutton Mountain Wilderness Study area. Um, and a lot of people have been traveling that area for a long time to look for fossils and pull stuff out of it, right? Um, so that's that's a pretty cool site in and of itself. And there's a lot more, I just, I can't go too deep into it, but there's a lot of cool stuff in that site. And the Hudspeth is just cool. Um, so then we finally get past the age of dinosaurs and we're starting to get to those mammals and we get to the Paleocene. Oregon is really starting to look like a thing, but then we don't have anything from that period of time. So this is like from 60 to 55 million years ago. We don't really have any deposits from this period of time in Oregon. And that could mean one of two things, either nothing was getting deposited, meaning there was no erosion from other places that deposited in this area of Oregon, or there was just no erosion happening in this particular area at that time. And if it did, maybe it got depo deposited in other areas. Um, so we'll move past that real quick and then we'll get to the Eocene, right? So we're looking between 50 and 40 million years ago, 33 million years ago, and Oregon's really starting to be a thing there. There's no cascades at this time, but there are volcanoes everywhere. And what does the world look like at this time? Well, if you've ever been to our visitor center and seen these cool murals, um, you'll know that coming into that first spot, it looks like a tropical jungle, right? It looks like what Panama looks like today. You've got 
um, all kinds of things like bananas and avocados and palmetto. Um, there's even a crocodile that we still have here in Oregon at the time, rhino relatives and a bunch of animals that look like things that live today but aren't even closely related. Um, the top image there represents the nut beds, which has like 700 species of plants or something like that coming out of it. It's a ridiculously high number and a lot of wood. Um, and then the lower image there represents the, um, the mammal quarry, which is just a little bit younger and shows a point bar button. There's hardly any plants from that. It's mostly animals. Um, it's a pretty cool site. Um, so the Palisades, if you've been off to the Clarno unit, um, each one of those lines that you see kind of going down the face of it there, those are all um, rainforest floors, right? So as you get lahars, which are these like mud flows that are coming off the flanks of the volcanoes and they capture all kinds of stuff, uh, nuts and wood and animals and things, and then it gets fossilized. Uh, so there's lots of cool animals. There's lots of horses at this time, rhinos. Uh, bizarre carnivores. There was a hooved carnivore called Harpocalestes that came out of this site, or not this particular one, but came out of this formation a few years ago. Um, it's so cool. I wish I could go more into it. Um, but so then we move out of the Clarno formation, out of the Eocene, into the Oligocene. And the Oligocene is really our bread and butter here in the John Day formation, the John Day fossil beds. Um, so this is about 30-ish million years ago, 33 million years ago, um, you see the big basin member. And this does not look like a tropical jungle anymore, does it? No, it is a temperate hardwood forest. Um, you see Metasequoia, our most or our, our favorite fossil here in Oregon, because it's our state fossil. Um, there's not a lot in the way of animals from this, but lots of plants. Um, and if you've ever been out to the Painted Hills, um, the Painted Hills, those are fossil soils from those forests from that particular period of time representing different types of environments, wet versus dry. Um, but then most of the fossils that we have are actually from uh, what you see in the lower left-hand corner, which are these kind of uh, drab looking lake bed deposits, but they are very important, very similar if I've ever been up to Fossil High School um, to dig up fossils there, that's what these are, are lake beds from that. Some of the things that we see, uh, we see the big basin member, uh, terrestrial mudstones and claystones, right, or in the big basin member. Sorry, I'm reading off my slide. I already said all that. Uh, but you do see some animals. So the skull that's over on the left is an oreodont, which is like a sheep, camel, pig like thing. It uh, doesn't have any modern ancestors uh, or descendants, I should say. Uh, it's a pretty cool thing. Next to that is a rhino jaw. I just pulled a cool fossil horse skull out of uh, a similar formation to the or similar exposure of this stuff, which is really cool. Uh, so horses again show up, but instead of being the like four toed, uh, four or five toed hiding into the forest sorts of things, this is more of a um, a bigger animal that's walking out on broader, drier soils. Um, and the upper right hand shows our metasequoia there, our state fossil. I couldn't get it. I couldn't do this without showing our state fossil. Um, and we do have a lot of fish and some other stuff that come out of here. There's a lot of uh, salamanders and other cool stuff that comes from these from these sites too. Uh, and then we move up a little bit more. Now we're between 30 and 25 million years ago, and we're in the Turtle Cove member. Still a hardwood forest, um, but a little bit more open than what we saw before, um, much more stream-based. And we actually see quite a lot of animals in this. Um, there's probably about 86 known taxa of vertebrate from, the, from this horizon, which is crazy that it's such a thin slice of time that we see so much of it. There's tons of volcanics in here. Here's Sheep Rock, um, which is the cool place that we have right next to the John Day River, right by our visitor center. And there's a loads of fossils that come from this. And that big brown layer that goes right through the middle, that is the picture gorgic nimbrite, which is a superheated fiery cloud of gas that came from the Prineville area, uh, from a caldera over there, and just wiped out everything. That forest got devastated and opened up the habitat a little bit there. About some of the cool animals that we do see in that lower left-hand corner is an artist depiction of the last primate that we have in North America that we find right off of Sheep Rock, actually, called Ekamua Shoshala Zinconella eye. Um, and I did practice that a few times to make sure that I could say it right. Um, but this is a lemur-like animal that we had here about 29 million years ago. Some of the other things we see, there's horses, uh, small mouse deer, lots of dogs, Oreodonts are everywhere, many, many different kinds of uh, rodents. 
And then if you see in the upper left-hand corner, there's those things that look like little Tic Tacs. That is the fossil grasshopper, grasshopper nest that I recently published on back in January. Um, and this is a one of a kind known from nowhere else in the world. And it's from the monument very close to um, the river, right? So this is a really cool thing that we have um, that's preserved from the National Monument. And these fossils are of that are only known from the National Monument and nowhere else. Um, so then as we move up out of the Turtle Cove member, we get into the Kimberly member. Um, it's a little bit more open during this time, still lots of volcanics. Uh, but we see a lot more rodents at this time, probably because it is more open at the time. There's some turtles and oreodonts and other things like that. There's a snail up there. Uh, but that center column are some rodents. So there's a mouse, a beaver, and the last thing down there, which is not a rodent, but a similar in size, that is a hedgehog that we recently discovered back in 2019 that we've been working on. And this is probably, um, this is the first skull that's ever been found in the Pacific Northwest, as far as I can tell, of a hedgehog ever. Um, so that's a really cool fossil um, that I'm really excited to get to work on, too. Uh, so now we're finally moving up into the next period of time, the Miocene. So this starts about 18 million years ago or so um, and ends about uh, 5 million years ago. But we start with more of the John Day formation, and that's broken down into four different layers, the Haystack Valley, the Johnson Canyon, the Balm Creek, and the Rose Creek members. Um, and generally, we kind of all lump them together into this display that we have, but it's still sort of forested. Um, you get a lot of interesting animals like entelodonts, which we do see before, and bear dogs, which we do see before. Entelodonts are like terminator pigs or hell pigs. Um, there's horses that still kind of look like horses during this time. This thing called a calicothere, which is like if you took a horse, a rhino, um, and a gorilla, and you shoved them all together. Uh, or sloth, actually, not a rhino, sloth, a horse, and a gorilla, shove them all together. That would be this animal, which is kind of weird, but also very cool. Um, and this is just another period of, like, forest with lots of streams and things like that. Um, then we move up into the Columbia River basalts. So I'm sure many of you have seen the Columbia River basalts, especially if you've driven through the Columbia River Gorge or gone um, that way down I-84 um, for any reason. Um, and generally, these are big flood basalt flows, uh, big columnar basalts that cover most of eastern um, and central Oregon and Washington. Um, but occasionally, we do get fossils in them, like that lower left-hand one is a stick that got caught <laughs> underneath one of the floor, uh, underneath one of the flows, and got roasted. Um, also, up in Washington, there's a rhino that had the same thing happen to it when it was in a lake, um, which is kind of cool that that sort of thing happens. Um, but just kind of giving you an extent here, um, this is generally the, the brown and gray is where we see exposures of the Columbia River basalts all over uh, this region, which is a fairly big area, right? And the photo I have on the right there is Picture Gorge, uh, which is within the monument. But this is a very extremely <laughs> dangerous time to be around you these slow moving flows all over the place. Um, and then once we get after that, and that event was about 16 million years ago, so right after that, you get the Maskell Formation. And I love this mural of ours because you see the Columbia River basalts and the Maskell Formation starting to form on top of that. Um, and during this time, this is when you really start to see the quote-unquote heyday of horses. So horses really start to diversify. You start seeing like horses that look more like what we see today. They're more adapted for open habitats. Um, you start to see elephants in the area. Uh, there's also true cat or uh, llama like camels that are really more prevalent. Uh, true cats start to show up. There are some false cats, false saber tooth cats before this. Um, rhinos, barrel bodied rhinos. It's a really cool period of time to be here. And there are relatives of horned rodents that we see out here as well. So, this is what that looks like. Um, go up to the Maskell Overlook in the park, and you can see this particular formation layered beds that are kind of grayish to buff in color. Some of the formations that we, or some of the fossils that we see are there. These horse teeth uh, that we see do kind of look like horses. There's some peccaries, which are like javelinas, uh, pond turtles, and weasels and other things. There's quite a lot of diversity during this period of time, but definitely more open habitat adapted animals. And we do even see some plants in the lake bed deposits that we have during this time. So towards the base is more lake beds, probably because the, the basalts were blocking stream channels which caused lakes to form until they could cut down through the basalt. Um, and then you see these other types of plants, which is also, again, more of a temperate sort of flora. 
And then we see neogene volcanics like this, uh, like these at the Strawberry Mountains. Uh, these are all volcanic events that happened during this period of time. Um, and that's the other thing. There's just tons of volcanics that are happening from a combination of hotspot volcanism and subduction zone volcanism. And then we get to the rattlesnake formation, which um, we go from our temperate forests to almost entirely sagebrush step with like what we see today. Um, and at the very top of the photo in the lower left is um, this thing called the uh, rattlesnake airfall tuff. And that is a another ignimbrite like what we saw in the middle of sheep rock. Um, and this is just one that comes from uh, down by Burns in the Harney Basin. So this eruption comes up, kills a bunch of stuff up in this area uh, about seven-ish million years ago. Um, and this is a cool period of time because you get the largest cat that, one of the largest saber-toothed cats that we have in North America um, is from this period of time. There's a running bear, uh, more elephants. Uh, you also see like horses that look like horses. And I don't think I had, I don't really have very good pictures of the horses there, but there's also pronghorn, rhinos, beavers, big camels, um, very different fauna from what we see today, but also a lot of similarities to what we see today. Um, there's also up closer to the, um, to Arlington, which is up by the mouth of the John Day River, is where we see the Alkali Canyon formation. And it's a lot of the same organisms that we see at the rattlesnake because it's about the same age uh, just a little bit further away and this is more uh, have more lake deposits which is different from the rattlesnake which is all stream um, and there's just a, a litany of different kinds of animals that we see from that formation also. Uh, now we're finally getting out of the Miocene we get into the Pliocene um, and this is more well known over at the Hagerman fossil beds in Idaho however we don't really have much of anything in Oregon especially in the John Day Basin. So it's another gap in time similar to what we saw with the Paleogene. So we'll just cruise on by that and we'll move to the Pleistocene, which is the last two million years. I kind of lumped the Pleistocene and the Holocene, which is today uh, together here um, during this time. We pretty much look the same. This is right when the ice ages are starting. Um, but what we see are a lot of terrace deposits. So when the river floods and leaves that sediment off to the side, uh, that's where a lot of these formations, it's not really a formation, but it's where we start to see those Pleistocene age things, right? And we see camels, bison, and snails in in these formations or in these rock units around here. Um, and this same methodology is the same, like the, the flooding of the river is the same way that a lot of the other deposits that we saw all the way through the Cenozoic back 70 million or 60 million years ago were deposited throughout this region, mostly through flooding, lake deposits, and other things like that. Um, and so it's continuing to this day. And this uh, fossil in the, in the lower part of the screen here is a camel um, hand bone that was preserved in that period of time um, more recently. So my conclusions here, uh, I'm hope, I hope that you got that there's a lot of changing environments uh, that have happened through this time, going from deep, ocean, uh, deep oceans uh, during the age of dinosaurs to the subtropical at the start of the age of mammals, all the way up to the sagebrush step that we see today, um, all preserved in one basin and one area. So we see a lot of these changes. There's a lot of volcanic and tectonic activity that has been recorded in these rocks, as well as all over Oregon. And just kind of leaving with the note of the John Day Basin is a critical part of our understanding of the past of this region and of the, nor of the Northwest, the state of Oregon, um, and the John Day Basin itself, um, and it's preserved through a variety of different public and private landowners, and we all work collaboratively together to make sure that this history is preserved, researched, and brought out to not only the scientific community, but the broader community um, and all over the world. So that is all I have, and I am good to take any questions that we might have at the time or have now. Oh, hang on. Uh, right before we get to questions, I'm okay. going to take a few minutes actually to um, right. talk about some stuff Oregon Lab is working on in the John Day <laughs> in the John Day River Basin. Um, so I'll share my screen again. Though I will say, uh, for those of you who haven't made it over to the monument in the John Day um, or the visitor center, I highly recommend it. It is so cool. 
Um, okay, but yeah, but like I said, before we get to Q&A, um, it's going to take a few minutes to tell you all about a huge and historic opportunity that Oregon Wild is working on right now to protect uh, more of the streams and public lands within the John Day River Basin. That opportunity is the River Democracy Act. And I'll just mention, feel free to keep um, submitting questions and we'll get to that right as I'm finishing. Um, so yeah, the River Democracy Act, um, as I mentioned in the intro, would add over 3,000, actually over 3,200 miles of rivers across Oregon to the National Wild and Scenic River System. Um, so on this map, all these uh, squiggly neon green lines that you're seeing are streams that would become wild and scenic under the River Democracy Act. Uh, all the dark blue lines are rivers that are already designated as the wild and scenic. And then here's a closer look at uh, the John Day River Basin. Um, so if you can see my mouse, we got the purple lines are already wild and scenic. So the lower John Day, uh, the South Fork, and the North Fork John Day. And then again, all these blue squiggly lines are um, rivers and streams that would become wild and scenic if the River Democracy Act uh, gets passed gets passed. Uh, so what is the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act? Um, it was first passed in 1968, and it really is our strongest um, river conservation tool and form of river protection that we have. Uh, so Oregon's own Rogue River, which is pictured here, uh, was one of the first eight Wild and Scenic Rivers that were designated um, in that original act in 1968, and then we've had several uh, designated since then. And today we have about uh, 2,000 miles of protected wild and scenic rivers across Oregon. To give you some perspective, that amounts to about 2% of our total river miles in Oregon. Um, and again, the River Democracy Act would add an extra 3,200 miles to that total. So that would bring us up to about 5%. Uh, so what protections does it provide? Um, first, you can't build a dam on the Wild and Scenic River, so it protects the river and its ecosystem from any uh, dam construction. Um, in addition to protecting the river itself, it also protects a half mile uh, buffer of land on either side um, of the stream. And then it also designates and protects what are called Outstandingly Remarkable Values, um, or ORVs. Um, so each Wild and Scenic River is given uh, certain values yeah, uh, for just for what makes the river special, and there can be more than one value um, for each river. So examples of these values can include fish and wildlife habitat, geologic, water quality, cultural, recreational, scenic, um, others as well. And then once the ORVs are established, then any use that would harm or degrade uh, one or more of the ORVs would be prohibited. So for example, if the river provides clean drinking water for a community or is important salmon habitat, then anything that could harm the water quality or that habitat uh, would not be allowed. And then uh, the streams of the John Day provide several important values. Um, so we learned a lot about the geology and paleontology values today. Uh, there's also important um, indigenous sites and cultural values and the John Day is also uh, a treasured outdoor recreation destination. Uh, the basin also provides um, some of the best and most important habitat for uh, Chinook salmon and Endangered Species Act listed steelhead um, in the entire Columbia Basin. Also provides a lot of important habitat for other wildlife species as well. And then the Blue Mountains bioregion, which the John Day River cuts through, um, is considered one of the most important habitat connectivity corridors uh, in the world uh, because it provides a corridor of public lands from the Rocky Mountains to the Cascades, which countless wildlife species depend on. And then um, here are uh, just a few of the threats to the ORVs um, of the streams in the John Day. Uh, so first, there's um, quite a lot of damage from cattle grazing along streams and riparian areas. Um, and then in the forests and headwaters of the John Day, there's a lot of commercial logging going on. Um, the middle section of the John Day is uh, actually mostly private land and therefore mostly unprotected. And as a result, a lot of the water um, is diverted from the river and used for agriculture and other uses, uh, which unfortunately sometimes leaves little water left in the actual river. 
And then climate change is also having a huge impact on water quantity and water temperatures. Uh, so that coupled with that um, excessive water use is actually leaving portions of the John Day almost dry. So this is a photo I took uh, of the John Day in August a few years ago. And you can see that um, it's almost completely dry here, which is not good. Um, and then climate change and warmer temperatures um, are also allowing invasive species, for example, smallmouth bass, uh, which is a warm water fish, to move further upstream the river system um, as the water continues to warm. So these fish uh, can have a pretty significant negative impact on native populations of fish, including salmon and steelhead. And then as uh, warmer temperatures allow these um, these fish, invasive fish, to colonize new habitat, uh, it's even more critical for us to protect um, these cold water tributaries that uh, salmon and steelhead depend on. And then again, um, another look of, again, all the streams in the John Day that would become protected under the River Democracy Act. And really all of these streams provide important habitat for um, salmon and steelhead and uh, cold water to the main stem. John Day. And then really quickly, here's a few of the streams, uh, photos of the stream. So we have Murders Creek, which is a tributary of the South Fork John Day, uh, the Middle Fork John Day, the North Fork John Day are all included in the bill. Um, and then here's some photos of um, three other streams across the state that would be protected under the River Democracy Act, because again, it this bill really includes um, streams and rivers from all corners of the state, including some of uh, Oregon's most treasured river systems like the Rogue, the Deschutes, the Oahe, the Clackamas, the Mackenzie, uh, and many, many others. Um, so you can uh, visit our website, learn more about the River Democracy Act, the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act, uh, and how you can help get this historic legislation passed. Uh, so Wild and Scenic designation takes an act of Congress, which means that it's up to us um, all of us to tell our congressional members that we want to see these rivers protected. Um, and you can do that by emailing, calling, tweeting, writing to them, attending their town halls, just um, showing up and telling them that you want to see these rivers protected. And if you live in Oregon, uh, we made it really easy for you to do this. You can take out your phone uh, and scan this QR code right now. Um, and send a pre-written message to Senators Wyden and Merkley, just encouraging them to get this bill passed. So I'll leave this up for a second in case anyone wants to do that. Um, and then we'll get to Q&A. So last chance to submit any questions you have for Nick. Uh, let me get the Q&A back up. Um, so first question, is there a recommended area for rock hounds to collect a few sunstones or other interesting rocks? <laughs> um, I'm actually not too familiar with good places to collect those sorts of things personally. I do know that the Bureau of Land Management and the Forest Service have a rock hounding map that you can get from one of their offices. Uh, so that's what I would recommend doing is trying to go into the like the Prineville district office for the BLM has this and I'm sure that the uh, Deschutes National Forest I know the Malheur National Forest out in John Day does sell this we used to sell it in our bookstore also but I don't remember if we have any more in stock, uh, but that's probably the best way to um, get access to those sites that are, you know, legal to collect from on public lands right and uh, and I'm glad that you're asking about rocks because fossils is a whole nother kettle of fish and there's different rules and regulations regarding that. But for rock counting, for gems and minerals, uh, it's a little bit more straightforward. And each land management agency does have a different uh, set of policies and rules regarding it. And that's why that map is going to be so important because it is such a patchwork out here. That was the next question. Um, is the public allowed to search this area for fossils? If so, um, how how does one who how does the layman go about doing that? Sure. So um, whenever you see the National Park Service arrowhead uh, like this one here, it pretty much means you can look at stuff, but don't touch anything. Right. Um, same thing with fish and wildlife. So that's part of the reason why National Park Service and fish and wildlife area was set aside was to preserve it like the 
The National Park Service's mission is to preserve and impair the natural and cultural resources of the of the park system. Um, so you can't collect anything in the monument. Um, and because some of our fossils are so delicate, we don't really uh, want people to be traveling off onto the bare rocks within the monument. But on BLM land um, and Forest Service land, it's free game pretty much to go wherever you want. That's multi-purpose land. So that's kind of the, the better places to do that. Um, you can't collect vertebrate fossils from those places without a permit. Um, but generally speaking, invertebrate and plant fossils are more accessible to collect. Or you can go to a place that's run by the state, like um, the Fossil High School site, uh, right up, right behind the the school in Fossil in the town of Fossil. Um, so those are some examples of some places that you can go to. Cool. Um, and then, could you explain what a false cat is? <laughs> sure. Yeah. So I didn't. I. I there's so many cool things I didn't get to talk so much about it, but so there's a false saber tooth cat. Um, and we call them that because they look like cats, they act like cats, but there's a couple of characteristics that tell us that they're not in the same family as true cats or the, yeah, the same family. Uh, so they like got different things going on with their skulls and whatnot that tell us that they're convergently evolved to look like cats, but they did it first. So again, this is probably cats look like this group of Nimravids. Um, so really it should be, a, the modern cat should be called false Nimravids, but uh, that's not the case. They actually have structures that look more like civets, which aren't true cats either, but they're alive today. Uh, so there's just, it's a nomenclature thing based on convergence. Cool. And we have time for one more question. Um, so uh, Amy is asking, I'm curious what fossilized pollen looks like. Is it much bigger than what's making me sneeze this week? It looks exactly the same in every way, shape, and form to modern pollen. Pollen has not changed very much at all. You just have to grab a bunch of dirt and process it to get these little microscopic pollen grains out of it, but it looks pretty much the same. And we can actually tell what kind of plants were around just from the pollen when we don't have leaves and things. It's pretty cool. Interesting. I lied. One more because I want to know too. Uh, what Here. is a smilodon? A, smi a smilodon? Is that what you said? Yeah, that's a smilodon. Okay, so Smilodon is a true cat that is a saber-toothed cat. Most people know it as a, quote, saber-toothed tiger, um, but it's not closely related to tigers at all. That's why a lot of scientists don't use the word tiger with that anymore. Um, but Smilodon is what you know from the La Brea, from La Brea the tar pits down in Los Angeles. So that's, that's that big saber-toothed cat that you know from down there. All right, um, that'll do it for tonight. Uh, thank you so much, Nick, um, for your presentation, for answering all the questions, for joining us tonight. <clears throat> and uh, thank you everyone in the audience for joining as well tonight. I hope you have a great rest of your night um, and take care everyone. We'll see you next time. Thank you.